In this week's drive, we take a new racer to the very edge of grip, get tangled up and hop out of the racing line, raise a smokescreen to decide a champion, and step up to an inauspicious debut. All this and more in this week's drive. We start at the Vallelonga circuit near Rome, the venue for a special Formula One testing session. For the first time since Italy's Giovanna Amati back in 1992, a woman was to have a serious drive in a Formula One car. Amati failed to qualify for Brabham and was replaced by Britain Damon Hill, son of double world Formula One champion Graham Hill, who himself went on to become world champion with Williams. Another woman, American Sarah Fisher, also performed a brief demonstration run with McLaren at Indianapolis back in 2002. But now, British driver Catherine Legg from Guildford in Surrey was one of several drivers taking part in the final test week for Minardi, following Red Bull's buyout of the team. Legg's test had been arranged with team owner Paul Stoddart several months ago, ahead of the deal. She's always wanted to have a Formula One drive, and so this session was literally a dream come true. It's just awesome. It's um, a fantastic opportunity for me and uh, it's been something I've worked towards since I was nine years old. So I'm enormously grateful to Paul Stoddard and Minardi and Ausjet for giving me the opportunity. You know, it's, uh, it's a chance of a lifetime. Giancarlo Minardi, founder of the Italian-based team, was more sceptical about women racing in Formula One because of the physical strength needed. First, we'll have to see how she does on her test. I have to say she has done well so far, but obviously Formula One is completely different to what she has done before. Physically, it will be a radical change, particularly to what a woman is used to. It was also Minardi's last outing before the name finally vanishes from Formula One after 21 years largely spent struggling among the backmarkers. Red Bull have renamed the team Scuderia Toro Rosso. Leg looked calm and confident beforehand, chatting with mechanics and engineers, waiting quietly for her test shift to come, before being introduced to the complex control systems in the cockpit. The 25-year-old former Carter has been racing in single-seater cars since 2000 and won three races in the US Toyota Atlantic Series this year, coming third overall. Then suddenly it was her turn. Quickly donning her pink and violet helmet, she jumped into the 770 horsepower car and was off. Spaniard Roldan Rodriguez, Uruguayan Juan Cacheres and two young Italians, Luca Filippi and Davide Rigon, also took part in the test sessions, as well as the regular Minardi tester, Chanak Nissany. Australian aviation entrepreneur Paul Stoddart also attended Legg's debut, his final task after selling Minardi to Red Bull. Stoddart himself would drive the very last lap ever run by a Minardi. All looked good on Catherine's opening laps, but things changed for the worse on her second. Catherine, who had never driven in a car with traction control before, went off the track on a bend and smashed into a concrete wall. She came through the crash and the medical checks unscathed and afterwards appeared slightly disappointed but confident in talking to journalists. Really it wasn't an accident, it was just a case of um, the traction control kicking in and obviously I've never driven a car with traction control on. So I came out of the power and it overrode the traction control. So like I say, it was just like turning the traction control switch off and, uh, and that was that really. As technicians inspected the tyres from her car and despite the setback, Catherine is sure that she will realise her goals, her gender not being an issue. Yes, I think um, there's no reason why we should not be equal. We, you know, as long as you you fit and you, you think almost like a, a man thinks, there's no reason why I couldn't do it. You know, I think I have the talent. I think I just have to prove that, that it's capable. A Minardi spokesman later described it as a little excursion into the scenery, blaming cold conditions and perhaps a little bit of overenthusiasm. Failing light meant she would get a second chance the following day. I believe that Formula One is a very difficult and strong job for a woman. Thus, it's difficult to make a similar step forward because one needs incredible physical characteristics to drive a Formula One car for a whole race today. The next day, she completed 27 laps, starting on intermediate tyres in cold and damp conditions before the team switched her onto dry tyres as the temperature rose and the track conditions improved.
The season-ending Formula 3 Macau Grand Prix has long been a hunting ground for racing talent scouts. The former Portuguese colony on the coast of China holds an annual festival of motorsport that has seen the emergence of many Formula 1 stars, men such as Senna, Hakkinen and Schumacher. Loic Duval threw away almost certain victory in the 50-second running of the race. The Frenchman, starting from pole, built up an early lead of almost two seconds. Behind him, Brazilian Lucas de Grassi passed Polish Robert Kubica, last year's runner-up, to go into second place. But de Grassi made a mistake on lap 10 when Kubica dived down the inside at the same corner. The pair would get a boost when Duval suffered a drive-through penalty for jumping the start. Nine of the 29 drivers competing didn't finish, including Bruno Senna, the nephew of Brazilian racing great Ayrton Senna, making his Formula 3 debut in Macau. He crashed after just one lap. Kubica then built a 1.6 second lead before officials dispatched the safety car onto the track after several accidents. There were seven crashes in all on the 6.1 kilometer street circuit, one involving British drivers Danny Watts and Dan Clark and American Charlie Kimball. The appearance of the safety car forced drivers to hold their positions as track workers cleared the stricken cars and debris. When the safety car left the track just before the start of the 14th and penultimate lap, Kubica initially held the lead, but Degrassi had closed right up on him. Degrassi snatched the lead as the pack accelerated on the run into Mandarin, and the Brazilian never looked back, taking the chequered flag half a second ahead of Kubica. He became the first Brazilian to win the Formula 3 Macau Grand Prix in 20 years. While the 21-year-old Di Grassi rejoiced in victory, he conceded he caught a lucky break. Kubica was slightly bitter in defeat. It was his second consecutive second-place finish in Macau. In third was German Sebastian Vettel. Brazilian Joao Paulo de Oliveira was fourth. And Japan's Kazuki Nakajima was fifth, ahead of pole position starter Duval, who was sixth. Duval set the fastest lap in the race on his ninth. De Grassi's achievement was overshadowed by the death of 45-year-old French endurance champion motorcyclist Bruno Bonhui, who crashed and was killed during practice. The final race of the long 36 event 2005 NASCAR season got off to a clean start in Homestead in Florida. But there was trouble for Scott Wimmer on lap 16. He spun and championship contender Jimmy Johnson narrowly missed crashing into him. Jimmy, where do I go? Man, that was close. There was drama too in pit lane. Ricky Rudd was leaving his pit unaware of another driver coming in, which was his team spotter's job. Rudd knocked over two members of the pit ahead of him, although they weren't hurt, thanks in no small part to crew members wearing helmets. Jimmy Johnson had been fortunate to avoid the collision when Scott Wimmer spun, but he had no such luck when his own right rear tyre went flat, causing him to crash and end not only his race, but any hopes he had for the championship. We heard him say, I don't know what this car is doing. Well, like I said, I mean, he knew something was wrong with With just 16 laps left, Tony Stewart knew he had to finish 25th or better to win the title if Carl Edwards was third or lower. Oh, he's sliding up the track. It was a two-car battle for victory. Greg Biffle in the number 16 car just nosed out veteran Mark Martin for the checkered flag. It meant that Biffle tied for second place in the point standings with Carl Edwards. But because Biffle had had more wins this season, six, he would claim second place on his own behind Stewart, who duly celebrated in the usual way. They rebounded from that nicely. Did not win a race in the chase. Tony Stewart finished 15th, and that was enough for him to win the 2005 NASCAR championship. Stewart also won the title in 2002. Along with winning a NASCAR race in August at the same track where they ran the Indy 500, Stewart said the title made for a perfect season. Yeah, this is the icing on the cake for sure. Uh, you know, to, to win at home at the Brickyard was... Uh, a race of a lifetime and a win of a lifetime for me and then to, to be able to finish it off with a championship I don't know uh, how we could ask for a better year this year this is absolutely perfect check for 5.8 million dollars as the 2005 Nextel Cup champion congratulations man well done Stewart is only the 14th driver in NASCAR history to win more than one championship and joins four-time winner Jeff Gordon as the only active full-time drivers with multiple titles.
In difficult, windy conditions, the F1 Powerboat's World Championship event started the same way as the three previous Grand Prix this season, with Scott Gilman of the USA racing for the Emirates F1 team, proving once again he's the fastest driver on the circuit as he took the lead from pole position on lap one. However, the opening lab also saw disappointment for a local driver. Mohammed Al Ali of Qatar was forced to retire with mechanical problems on the first lap with his engine barely warm and race stewards hoisted the yellow safety flag. 49 laps to go and Gilman started where he had left off, the American holding his lead at the halfway stage, 1.22 seconds ahead of Frenchman Felipe Desatene. However, disaster struck once again for Gilman on lap 38. He had to retire with sudden engine problems and his stricken vessel was passed by Desateni and the world championship leader Guido Capolini of Italy. Consistency has been a problem for Gilman all season. He has only 15 points in the standings and that was from the opening race of the season in Portugal. The stewards restarted the race again and this time it was Capolini who took the advantage. The 47-year-old Italian overtook Desatene and powered to the finish line on the 50th and final lap to take the chequered flag in victory in a time of one hour and 50 seconds, claiming another 20 championship points. He finished 2.1 seconds ahead of second place Desatene and 5.3 seconds clear of Finn Sami Salio in third place. With the win, eight times world champion Capolini registered his 49th career victory and edged his way closer to a ninth world title by winning the inaugural Grand Prix of Qatar. Capolini now holds a 25 and a half point lead over Salio and hopes to claim his ninth world title at the Grand Prix of Abu Dhabi. Second position, The organisers of the Dakar Rally have unveiled the route for the 28th running of the Epic Marathon, which will take place from the 31st of December to the 15th of January next year. For the first time, the rally will set off from Portugal, with 508 teams entered. The lineup includes 240 motorcycles, 188 cars and 80 trucks, along with 240 backup and assistance vehicles. After two new style special stages in Europe where competitors will be timed over roughly 200 kilometers, the caravan will arrive in Africa where it will cross Morocco, Mauritania, Mali, Guinea and Senegal and the epic journey ending on the banks of Lac Rosé. During this long trip, covering a total of 9,043 kilometers and including almost 5,000 kilometers of racing special stages, the emphasis is on a return to navigation, the founding principle of rally raids. This time, GPS functions will be deliberately reduced, obliging drivers and co-drivers to navigate exclusively according to information given in their road books. Moreover, several measures, such as fixing speed limits to 160 km an hour and reducing autonomy for bikes, have been adopted with a view to improving safety conditions for competitors and the local population. Here's a montage from the most recent Dakar rally. Oh, my God. 
The current title holders, biker Cyril Dupre, biker turned car racer Stefan Peterhansel and Ferdows Kabirov in the truck category, would all be back to defend their crowns and face the tough competition. Volkswagen officially unveiled their entry for the 2006 Dakar Rally, the Race Touareg 2, at the Essen Motor Show in Germany. Volkswagen clearly mean business as they look to wrest the car title from Mitsubishi and French driver Stefan Peterhansel. In 2005, they placed third and fifth, the first time a diesel-powered vehicle had made it onto the podium. The Race Touareg scored four stage victories and led the overall classification for four days. Leading drivers are Dakar 2001 winner Jutta Kleinschmidt and co-driver Fabrizia Pons. 93 Dakar winner Bruno Sabi and co-driver Mikel Perrin of France also drive for Volkswagen, as does South Africa's Canille de Villiers, partnered by Tina Torner, who've moved across from Nissan. Twice World Rally champion Carlos Sainz follows in Colin McRae's footsteps in making the change from rallying to marathons with his co-driver Andy Schultz. The German team claims to have made advances in all the key areas, with improvements in visibility, handling and suspension, as well as by the engine and the chassis. Chris Nissen, Volkswagen's motorsport director, has no illusion about the team's objectives. Our target for the Dakar 2006 must and will be, we want to win. We are ready for it, the team is fantastic, the drivers are fantastic, we have very good technique with the new car, so I am really pleased to say we have a good feeling and we want to win. Spain's Carlos Sainz is one of the newcomers to the Dakar. The Spaniard, a former double world rally champion, is excited about competing for Volkswagen, but he has no illusions either. I think uh, in terms of the car, the evolution of the uh, race to leg is, is really good in all, all the uh, in all the conditions. And I think Volkswagen has a, a good lineup of drivers with a lot of experience, good speed, good knowledge. And concerning myself, uh, well, I think uh, I'm here to learn, and it will be a little bit unrealistic to, to think in, in a victory, but. Uh, uh, to win in the future, you need to, to be here and learn about the race, and that is what I am trying to do this year. The new car scored second, third and fourth places overall for Kleinschmidt, Sainz and Sabi at the recent Rally Baja Porto Alegre in Portugal. In his marathon rally debut, Carlos Sainz set fastest times on the first day. On the second day of the event, the Spaniard was leading but dropped back with a broken exhaust bolt. Jutta has raced the Dakar on a works BMW motorcycle and won the car event in 2001. Then we come down to Mauritania and we will have a lot of soft sand and dunes and it will be hard for us drivers to pass it and you can lose a lot of time there so I think it will be very important for the result. And then uh, we, also this year the navigation is much harder than the years before and this means especially in Senegal I think you can do big mistakes because uh, in Senegal you have a lot of pistes going anywhere and to find the right one there will be very difficult. In Portugal, the works drivers had to wrestle with torrential rainfall across muddy and slippery roads. Not that this is likely to be a problem in the African desert. Bruno Sabi and Perrin, who had clinched an early title win in the Marathon Rally World Cup in July, lost time with poor vision caused by window fogging. Volkswagen's new signing Mark Miller and his German co-driver Dirk von Zitzewitz finished that event in sixth place. Former World Rally Champion Richard Burns has died after a long illness. The Briton, who was 34, died of a brain tumour with his partner, family and close friends at his bedside. He'd been in a coma for some days. Burns became the only English driver to win the world title in 2001 with Subaru. He was diagnosed with astrocytoma, a form of brain tumour, after blacking out at the wheel on his way to the British Rally in Wales in 2003 where he could have won a second championship with Peugeot. He'd been due to return to Subaru in 2004, but the illness forced him to withdraw. The Briton, overall runner-up in 1999 and 2000, and winner of 10 rounds of the World Rally Championship, had a course of chemotherapy and radiotherapy last year, and in April this year underwent brain surgery.
From the outset, Richard knew that the odds were heavily against him, and yet he fought his illness with bravery and good humor, said his family in a statement. Having undergone both chemotherapy and radiotherapy, he was able to leave hospital in summer 2004, and for a while his health showed signs of improvement. But then, after six months, it again began to decline. Determined not to give up, he opted for surgery earlier this year. This alleviated some of the symptoms of his illness and enabled him to remain active. However, there was to be no miracle and he lapsed into a coma. Tributes flooded in from the rallying community, led by World Rally Supremo David Richards, whose ProDrive company also runs the Subaru team. The only other Briton to have won the championship was Scottish driver Colin McRae, also a Subaru, back in 1995. The two drivers were great rivals, contrasting personalities who frequently clashed, but also respected one another. By a somber coincidence, his death came on the fourth anniversary of his championship win with Subaru in 2001. Snowmobile freestyling may be a new extreme sport, but it certainly attracted the crowds in the Russian capital of Moscow. Around 35,000 spectators packed out the Red Square at the Kremlin to witness the Russian premiere of this new and dangerous pastime. The staging was certainly impressive, with a decent lights display and DJs on hand to provide good music to the ears of the fans. Snowmobile freestyling comes from America, like many extreme sports, and can be compared to motocross freestyle. However, this version in Moscow is considered by many to be far more dangerous. The machines can reach speeds of 140 kilometers an hour and weigh more than 250 kilograms each, with the drivers jumping to a height of 15 meters and lengths of 30 meters. The slightest slip could be lethal for any driver landing a machine of that kind of weight. Those at the top of the game, however, seem to be able to handle the snowmobiles with ease. Snow was in short supply in Moscow at the weekend, so the Red Bull Revolution on Machines, a knockout systems race, was carried out on wood chips to soften the landing slightly of anyone who may have fallen off. Almost half of the 11 of the best sportsmen in the world dropped out during training and the early stages of the race, and there were several spectacular falls. American Dane Ferguson lost two teeth when he crashed, while his compatriot Chris Berant lost contact with his machine at a height of 10 meters before falling to the ground. However, no one was seriously injured, and no one needed any medical help. In the end, however, someone had to come out on top, and here it was American Jason Hoyer. Um, it's always good to be a little bit nervous about doing it, else you know you, you're not paying attention. So I'm always a little bit scared, but it's good to be scared and then conquer it and feel good. Perhaps the first of many wins in this new extreme sport. We leave you this week with the memory of a champion taken too soon. Make sure you catch next week's Drive.